I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next item is uh, item three is a moment of thanks, appreciation, or condolences. Start on the left side. Anything, Robert? I have a, a couple. One is uh, condolences to the six individuals that were missing there at the bridge in, in Baltimore. A tragedy. And then uh, also prayers for peace and negotiations in the Middle East. It's been too long and coming alive. Uh, well, lost. And the other one is uh, the Apollo family here in Guadalupe. Uh, they've lost their mother. Um, I, I know Rudy and a couple more uh, of his family members. And uh, services will be next week sometime. So condolences to them. Uh, next item uh, agenda review. Is there a city council member who wishes to move the order of business that's presented? I'm good. 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 Okay. The next item is the ceremonial calendar and it's a proclamation expression of appreciation to Hannah Sanders for her services as recreation service manager of the city of Guadalupe. Uh, it's my pleasure to read this. It's sad, but it's my pleasure anyway. Proclamation expressing appreciation to Hannah Sanders for her service as recreation service manager of the city of Guadalupe. Whereas Hannah Sanders was hired as recreation service manager on January 10th. Uh, 2022 and provided professional recreation management to the city, helping generate commitment to continuous improvement to this growing department that will continue well into the future. And whereas Hannah has served the city and residents of Guadalupe well and has exhibited her strong sense of civil service, dedication to provide an excellent recreational and park service and professional expertise. And whereas Hannah has been able to begin upgrades and renovations to all our facilities and parks including the City Hall Auditorium, we were at Park Phase 2, uh, additions and renovations, and has assisted in the planning and design of the new Central Park. Whereas Hannah developed partnerships with outside organizations to bring more programs to Guadalupe for all ages of the community, such as the Boys and Girls Club, Youth Evolution, Basketball and Soccer, Little House by the Park, and whereas, whereas Hannah has created annual events and activities like Father-Daughter Dance, Cinco de Mayo Celebration, and seasonal movie light night and collaborated with organiz with other organizations to bring about the grand opening event uh, of Lira Park, uh, Los Puentes Unidos Resource Fair, Dia de los Muertos Celebration, and ran both adult drop-in sports nights and sports leagues, as well as offered a variety of uh, creative recreational activities for the entire community. Whereas the city of Guadalupe has benefited from Hannah Sanchez's commitment of time energy, knowledge, and intelligence in numerous projects, initiatives, and matters in order to grow the recreational opportunities in Guadalupe. Now, therefore, be resolved by the virtue vested in me as a mayor, and on behalf of the City Council, City of Guadalupe, I take this opportunity to express sincere appreciation and recognition to Hannah's message for her dedication, commitment, value, contribution to the city, citizens of Guadalupe. Thank you, Hannah. Okay. We're gonna miss you. Oh, um, Mayor, can I uh, yes. offer her? Um, and and we want to thank you as well, staff from the whole city. Here's uh, some flowers. And if you don't mind, uh, I want to read something for Shirley. Um, the Friends of Guadalupe Public Library, the Rancho de Guadalupe Historical Society, and I personally wish to thank Hannah for her steadfast assistance to each of us in scheduling the event and getting notice to the theater marquee. Well done, Vian Hensho, Anna, enjoy your new phase of life. And also another gift from them, I will hand it to you, is this.
There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and the proclamation didn't mention that she could dump the basketball, <laughs> yeah. uh, great softball player, and a volleyball player. Yeah. And she mows lawns. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you, Hannah. We'll miss you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right. Um, <laughs> Presentation by the Ninth Street Bridge Mural 2024 Community Project. Who's up? Stephanie? Yes, I'm up first. Um, my name is Stephanie Kraus, and I'm a local person. I think I know almost everybody here, and I've been living in Wellesby for 26 years. And um, about years ago, I started murals in Guadalupe. And um, this year, Nico Navarro and I are contracted artists, excuse me, we're contracted artists with FSA, the Little House by the Park, um, and the Guadalupe Community Changers. And we have, we're being paid through a business um, where uh, we're supposed to bring art to the community um, and also to get art in the community and get the community making art. So Nufo came up with this idea of why don't we figure out how we could get the train bridge painted. And when he said that, I thought, wow, that would be amazing. Uh, especially because on all my walks around town and on my trips out to murals, I would see train bridge and I would see graffiti and I see graffiti covered up. And just wonder, wow, what what could this be? Um, with the murals that I've already done in, in Guadalupe, I've noticed that when you have a mural, um, for whatever reason, uh, people that might have wanted to be safe areas that don't have any art, they seem to leave it. Um, on the mural that I worked on with with um, Gilbert Robles um, on Ninth Street, we noticed that. Uh, the graffiti people just waited and watched. They waited to see what was going to happen. Um, and when they saw that the wall got painted, left it alone. So the power of art is huge. And um, that's what this presentation is, is about. We're hoping to inspire the city to be on board with getting the train bridge painted. So, um, Nufo, can you come up here now? <laughs> he, he's come up with a really nice presentation. Your uh, clicker, right? Let's get to it. Speak one or not? Long standing community bridge. Um, I feel like uh, everybody who I feel like everybody's familiar with the bridge. If you're not, step outside. It's right there. Um, you know, as long as I've known it, um, this I've always loved this bridge. Um, it's the biggest bridge in town. It's pretty large. Um, and it's just like for I've used it. You know, different ways working out just transportation. I think it, it's just a um, Really meaningful community bridge that uh, is meaningful to community at large or be used to. So, what I envision and what's like really cool about it is it's standing at the east and west, uh, and in the four directions. Um, that's representing, you know, Dawn and Doug. I think that would be a great representation on these huge pillars. Uh, we have transients. I mean, daily, the Amtrak, and these people have no idea that our rich city is here, really. It's, it's a tiny city, but this, these images that we'll put up there will be seen, and that would be, you know, they'll recognize that, and I'm like, oh, what was that? It was, I think it's, it'd be a huge opportunity for, our community to be really on the map on California on this like, um, on the train. On the 
that's what I'm envisioning for the immediate just all around full um and rising on the east side of this. It's really um, special to our town is it has lots of migrants and it's just a lot of people coming and going from the get go. Um, early on, about 100 years ago, it was boldly, you know, Swiss Italian and just 4% Mexican. Uh, it was very large Japanese. Um, we had a large uh, Filipino community um, that kind of shifted uh, and that's what kind of got my attention with the, the suitcases. It shifted um, in World War II um, when our Japanese community was really ripped from our community and um, kind of what the suitcases uh, represent. But not only that, you know, we have migrants coming in and out of our community all the time. And sometimes their whole world is wrapped up in this suitcase. Um, so I think suitcases are very fitting um, to be in. This would be placed on. Right there. So, um, <laughs> on this side right here, this area right here, and this area right here. I imagine suitcases, and you know, we can even personalize it with, you know, make sure everybody has a name and know and, you know, put them on there. We didn't just get here, you know. One of our ancestors got us here, and the probably by the but to get here, even if it, you know, is a little odd, but still, somewhere, you know, we're here. Uh, and then, following up the sides of the uh, main pillars on each side, I imagine um, some rose, roses, um, climbing vines right at the top, thing roses really kind of makes sense of all of the. Is it? Um, this is actually actually um, could be opportunity possibly for more funding um, for businesses to get their uh, name on here. But regardless, this would be, I would imagine this would be a great area to um, paint businesses and their um, logos, what have you, that help build this community. You know, make it what it is today. That these things, you know, long standing uh, or have you know had roots in our community that a lot of us share, you know, memories. These are things that, you know, the go-to or that dinner or um, restaurant that one time that it stayed up, this restaurant stayed up open way too late, but, you know, it was a lot thing that they're, they're there, they're right there partying with you. Um, so it would be nice to pay homage to them. And the community members that shape our community, Cultures like it is our favorite. Um, this area on top here of the bridge would be um, a spot for Indian uh, community members. Um, some of the members you might recognize, um, others from the past, Tim and Harry, um, Steve, um, Joe. These are the people that. That really shaped us and um, led our, our community to where it is today, pointed us in the right direction, and really gave a helping hand when this community needed it. And I think that would be a great opportunity to pay homage to them. Um, and then this lower area down here will be for us. Um, makes up our own town today, you know, people that come out and help on mural. It's a chance to put your family name down. This is everybody and anybody who currently makes it. And this is, I want to paint this as a real community project. This is something that's going to, you know, we're going to spend time on. You know, we're going to be out there and food out there, music out there, and it's you know, almost like a block party. You know, this is, but it's somewhere you want to be at. And it's, um, this is this time, some time and go, and it's time we're going to remember and hopefully enjoy it forever. So we'll get finished. That was fun. Really fun. Stuff. Never were doing it. 
And so um, looking for outward, outward, we got the budget to be developed. We have to be researched on how much, you know, we're going to get the bridge clean, spray wash, primer, all these necessary things that we're going to require a forklift or a stitcher jack, what have you. Um, all these things will be researched. Timeline, what does this look like? What the time, what day we're going to, you know, start it, complete it, and support um, kind of all hands on deck of just like kind of just grabbing from the community. community um, is, is So in conclusion, we really think that this project, um, you know, it brings things like community beautification, community involvement. These are things like we've noticed um, you know, people don't, people care about what they work on. You know, somebody who they're going to, I want the community to take care of this because they're going to work hard on this. They're going to destroy it. It's like, oh, well, we worked hard on this. Don't mess with that. This is ours. Um, enriching Guadalupe community, Guadalupe landmark. You know, these are things that, this is a huge bridge that will be, you know, a landmark. And from the transients on the train to us just, you know, walking around, we'll know it, you know, it's our story told by us. Thank you. You know, that um, thinking outside the box, this really does it, you know, and, and I know that with the uh, Central Park or whatever is going to be named in the future, that ties right into, you know, the bridge. Um, you have the, the jail, the Historical Society's uh, jail there that it all encompasses a lot of history. And you've mentioned a lot of history in terms of of the Japanese, of the Chinese, of the Filipinos, uh, the main counties of the field workers. So I think it's uh, it'd be a tribute to that the community. So um, the the bridge. I don't. Know, this is probably a question for Phil. The, the, I'm not sure if we put it there or if uh, the railroad, uh, the Southern Pacific, put it there. Yes, Mr. Mayor Todd and I were just chatting about that. Um, for the presentation, whether some kind of permits would be required or not, we don't know. Okay. So we'll have to look into that, but uh, we will. I think uh, in, in addition to that, I know that in speaking with uh, Gilbert, who has a, one of the shots, you can almost see his barbershop shop over there. And one of the things that we've discussed is using Central Park or whatever it's gonna be called um, as a venue for people blocking up that street to where you can have events at that, that park, including the, including the, you know, the, the bridge. I think it's a great, it's a great project. It's uh, at, you probably you're looking at the budget, and that'd be another. That's one that's uh, that's going to come up uh, quickly. What's what's your time frame? You know, if you had all money in the world, what's your what's the time frame? If I had all, I would start. Um, I'll be. Maybe a week after the kids got out of school, really attack the um, summer and try to just like tear through the summer and kind of paint it as such of like, this is what we're doing. This not food out here, you know, music and we're going to paint, you know, we're paint, tell our story. How about community involvement? You mentioned school. Is there, is, are kids going to be involved in it or is it, I'm sure they're not going to be up in the scaffolding. Uh, are we in <laughs> <laughs> you know, the insurance I signed it off. <laughs> um, I imagine, uh, yeah, definitely um, adults up in there, but yeah. um, just kind of like painting outline and letting people go to town, right? Pretty much cool. just having everybody, anybody. It's also on the budget. I want to know. I was talking to Karen, um, and she had mentioned that uh, Amtrak uh, has like budget for arts too. Mm -hmm. um, that somebody, some uh tapped into it and so that's also an avenue to be researched on okay. for budget well that's with the voice of the council here uh, i really um, want to thank you for how outlook like um no, our no, story no. is told by us i think that's really important just for me from all the people our story is told by us i think that is really important i actually posted something in 2020 
Um, there is a video that I found. It was FBI raids West Coast Town, Guadalupe, April 29, 1942. Japanese, com Japanese community members in Guadalupe are rounded up, allowed to only take two suitcases, taking from their homes many to never return. Um, hearing these stories are really heartbreaking, um, and it's important that we continue to make, make sure that these stories are told. I think it's a great project. What do you need from us? Besides, Money, money. <laughs> um, um, I guess at this point, uh, so I guess unanimous support and um, research. Uh, yeah, we have to we'll have to bring this back for action and budget items and permits and further information. So there, there's no promise at this point. Just to make that clear. Well, there's a promise that we support it. I, yeah, I understand <laughs> clearly, but uh, there's there's no. Um, no commitment. It can't. And that's or what Jen does is presentation of information on that. Your promise. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Right. That's fun. Next time, uh, uh, in the presentation by the broadband survey results and updates. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, as you know, the broadband survey was a fairly sizable project for the city. So I'm going to be a bad teacher and actually read a lot of these slides, try not to fall asleep, but try to keep it relatively succinct. So uh, for those of you who don't know about the broadband survey, why did we do it? Uh, the Guadalupe Broadband Navigator Project was created to get the most accurate data available on the baseline existence and quality of broadband services within the city of Guadalupe, California. Conceived as a census-style survey administered door-to-door, -door, this data would be used by organizations and or departments within the city, county, state, and federal agencies to help make decisions for the most effective deployment of ubiquitous broadband solutions for the city and the county. As a side note, um, this was the first census style survey in the county, in the tri-county area. And so uh, it's being used as a pilot, as a model for other communities. So that puts a, a little exclamation point on Guadalupe. So we can all pat ourselves on the back for that. Um, in addition, in addition to bridging the digital divide and improving equity within the residential population, there is significant evidence of a strong relationship between broadband availability and business efficiency and innovation. Without access to reliable broadband within the business districts, including the downtown business corridor, as well as the manufacturing and industrial areas, the ability for the city to attract new businesses will be at a significant disadvantage. I guess I can be. There you go. There, there you we go. go. <clears throat> Multitasking, right? <laughs> so how did we do this, this survey? So the first thing we did was location analysis. Because this was meant to be a census style survey, there were going to be multiple canvassers going door to door. The city would have to be broken up in such a way the canvassers would be able to maximize their efficiency and not tread the same ground that other canvassers may already have completed. Additionally, because there was a focus on utilizing canvassers from within our own community, rather than employing personnel from outside the area, we created districts which allowed canvassers to select areas that they felt that they were familiar with the population and the languages spoken therein. So how did we do it? There were 15 districts that covered the entirety of the city. Mm -hmm. District 1 was at the westernmost side of the map. Uh, Over there was District 1. District 8 and 9 were on the southern border of the city map and were comprised of the new Pasadena developments. Those were down here. Districts 10 and 11 provided the eastern side of town, known as the Treasure Park area here and um, districts 12 and 13 border the northernmost edge of town up there 
Districts 7, 13, 14, and 15 included residences as well as the downtown business corridor. So all down through that area. And that included retail, restaurants, commercial, industrial, and manufacturing. <laughs> so then we had to develop the survey itself. Significant thought was put into the development of the broadband survey. Above all, the focus needed to be on the surveys being simple and direct. During the development process, we asked ourselves the question, what is the point of this survey? This was foundational because the survey needed to reach as many people in the community as possible. We knew that there were language barriers. We suspected that there might be cultural barriers as well. This in reference to both racial and age-related culture. To be as inclusive as possible, we felt the surveys needed to be short, to the point, and available in at least English and Spanish. <clears throat> the questions were developed to be easily understood and to focus on the following. One, what's the baseline of internet connectivity from the entire community, not just those that have access to broadband? And to be clear, many surveys that have been done in the community in the past, the, the canvassers or the, the people that generate the survey say, hey, connect to your internet and take the survey. What's well, problematic because that introduces bias. You can't take the survey if you don't have internet, which really is the point of the survey. So we wanted to also find the level of available service for those that had it. We wanted to get a baseline understanding, a baseline of the understanding when it came to two key industry marketing terms, broadband and fiber. Most of you that have internet here or have gotten marketing materials that they all say broadband, they all say fiber. What was really interesting was how many people had no idea what those terms meant. We've got a lot of people that are paying for stuff. They don't know what they're paying for. Why or why not survey respondents use their internet connection? And if there was community interest in the provisioning of broadband as a public utility. So, Recruitment of canvassers. One of the unique features of the Guadalupe Broadband Survey was its focus on utilizing local canvassers to conduct the survey. This was based on the hypothesis that there would be a stronger survey response from an in-person request versus an impersonal postal or online survey. As a result of these efforts, canvassers were either living in Guadalupe or Santa Maria and were former residents of Guadalupe or parts of organizations that were active within the city. Data collection. The data collection process went relatively smoothly. Several web-based resources have charted the success of survey responses. Some of those metrics include 33% of the average response rate for all survey channels, including in-person and digital. Um, a good survey response rate ranges between 5% to 30%. An excellent response rate is 50% or higher. Response rates vary widely for different types of surveys, customer satisfaction surveys and market research, market research surveys often have response rates in the 10 to 30% range. Our survey ended up with nearly 50% response rate. So we were pretty excited about that. <clears throat> so uh, as you can see it with the aggregate survey response rate for the Guadalupe was 48 point. Three, five. Whoops. There we go. Kind of hard to see at the bottom, but it's an orange. So, uh, any questions so far before I continue on? There's going to be a test after this? There will not. <laughs> so, at least pretend you're awake. <laughs> so, you know, what was the point? What were the results? Well, first question Are you connected? The most basic question of connectivity provided a clear indication that broadband was available and used within the city. We had over a thousand respondents, almost a thousand of you said yes, about a hundred said no. How are you connected? And for those of you that are mathematicians, you will notice that the percentages add up to more than a hundred percent. And this is because people could select more than one answer just making sure um the majority of respondents connected via wi-fi 
Just over half of respondents connected via a quote hardwire or wire based connection. That's like the Ethernet cables or or fiber optic. Much smaller percentages use cellular hotspots, satellite connections, or only use their cell phones to connect. Typically, because the city does not enjoy a wireless network, either through private or public funding, the reality is most people that use Wi-Fi, it should really be about 100%, the same, the same number that use hardwired uses mm -hmm. Wi-Fi, because you're using Wi-Fi through a hardwired connection. But if you don't understand fully what you're using, then you're not going to know that. So um, the vast majority of people, again, it's the comfort and, and familiarity with the phrase, oh, Wi-Fi. I know that. I use that. And so that's what they said. All right. Speed and reliability satisfaction. This, this one's interesting. The majority of residents connected via Wi-Fi, just over half of the funds connected with hard, uh, hardwire, already said all that. So does your connection speed meet your needs? Well, 77% of the respondents said yes, of, of those who were connected. Um, only 22% said no, 1% said sometimes. But what's important here is context. And I'll get to that a little bit later in, in my rambling <laughs> narrative here. Is your, is your connection performance reliable enough for your needs? Again, roughly the same amount, about 74% said yes, it's reliable enough. About 24% said no, and back to that 1% said sometimes. So on the surface, it sounds like by and large, the community for the amount of complaining I think we all hear on the street, most people don't seem to be satisfied with speed and reliability. At least that's what the data says. But as I said, context matters. And we will get to that. But first, we're going to talk about who do you use? Spectrum accounted for nearly 91% of survey of service of survey respondents. <clears throat> the largest competitor was Frontier, and they accounted for less than 6% of the respondents' market share. So really, Charter Spectrum is the behemoth in the community. And then we asked people, well, why? Why do you connect to the internet? So this was interesting. <laughs> the top reason for usage was entertainment. Maybe it wasn't surprising, but it was interesting that people actually said, yeah, this is what I'm connecting for. 75% of the respondents cited that that was their reason for using connectivity. Shopping and working from home were nearly equal at 55 to 56%. Gaming and healthcare were the next tier at 47 to 45% respectively. Other was cited by about 10% of respondents and reasons included business transactions like point of sale systems, um, social media, and online banking. So we asked the question, do you understand? So what are, what are we even talking about? What is interesting is that over half the survey respondents that are currently connected to the internet don't understand the basic terms of broadband or fiber, even though they are dominant keywords that is used in industry marketing materials. It is not surprising that the corresponding numbers increase for those that are not connected. We feel that providing educational opportunities for the local community can help with baseline understanding of technology so that they can make better decisions as consumers. And in support of those numbers, or in support of those statements, for connected users, people that actually are paying money to connect to the internet, 46% of them said they understand the term broadband. 53% said, I don't know what that means. Do you understand the term fiber as it relates to the internet? Only 38% of people who are actually paying for internet services understood. 62% said they had no idea. They did not understand. Not surprisingly, non-connected users you had 21% that said they understood broadband, 79% said they didn't. 20% said they understood fiber, 80% said they didn't. 
So, final question, really, um, almost the final question was, what do you think of broadband as a utility, like water or trash, basically a service that you're paying the city for? For people that had a connection, it was overwhelmingly uh, showing interest in it. 85% of the respondents said yes, they would consider using internet service if it was a public utility. 13% said no, 2% were on the fence. Of non-connected users, they would consider getting a connection if it were a public utility. 60% of them said they would consider it. 39% said no, only 1% said maybe. Which begs the question, for those that were not connected, why are you not connected? Nearly half of those without service said that they did not need it. This could be due to access at work or another location like a library. There was also a large percentage of those without service that mentioned that cost was a factor. This was interesting considering the high percentage of what's called the Affordable Connectivity Program or the ACP, which was done here in, in Guadalupe and around the county. And the ACP provided discounted internet services. That program was recently sunset in uh, February, February, March. So it would be interesting to see what type of change in, in response we would have gotten from the community if the ACP was not available. In fact, Guadalupe had the highest percentage of qualified enrolled households in the entire county. We had 95% of people who qualified for the program actually take advantage of it, which was pretty amazing. But that's also kind of scary because they just terminated the program. So, moving on. That's, I know it's kind of hard to uh, see that, but I thought some interesting thoughts to share from our canvassers. This is community people who were doing the surveys. They were the ones that were going door to door and talking to people. And they had some interesting insights. Um, I did uh, I did post survey interviews with the canvassers, and these are some of the things that they said. Some community members thought we were selling things or questioned the survey legitimacy. It would have been better if uh, they had been notified directly by the city. Some asked for city business cards or their leave behinds. The change of a sponsorship from uh, which was a fiscal sponsor of the of this program that was funded through the uh, Santa Barbara Foundation. We had to change midstream from Los Amigos de Guadalupe to the Service Agency. And that change made some people cautious. Some people would have liked an online option. Um, and there were some people that were saying that they were, may have been a competitive survey by Frontier around the same time. Most people seem to feel that there were no good pathways of communication in the city. The general feeling that the city does not care about its citizens, they feel ignored. And that's really a perception based on communication, because obviously they're not being ignored. Many were surprised that the city actually wanted their opinion. Interestingly, age seemed to be separated by district with some canvas district, primarily 40 years or older and others with lots of kids. Language was more consistent across all canvas districts, although Mixteco was very concentrated in one of the districts in particular. Lots of people think a change would be a good thing for the residents because charter spectrum is a monopoly. Competition would provide better cost or services. Internet is a necessary thing for medical and online build and education when it is very it is a very important thing to address. And again, I'm, I'm, these are quotes. I'm not espousing my opinions here. Um, hearing things like the need for more lighting for kids and other safety improvements more than once it seems that the city needs a better way to communicate more broadly with its citizens. More information in more languages, more transparency with budgets and how money is used because there is distrust in where publicized money goes. This can be done with more information in the water bill. It's a great opportunity for Guadalupe. Many support the possibility of having it be invoiced with and like utilities. So this was, it was interesting to get this kind of feedback from people talking to the community. Um, things like the lighting, I heard from more than one person. Uh, they would they would just take the survey and say, "Hey, what here? What can we do about the lights over here?" The campers <laughs> were like, "I don't know. I better do a survey." So 
it was interesting that once people felt that there was a connection, they really reached out. And there was there was more than one instance where we had a cancer go to a door right. and a person would say, ah, you know, I don't really want to do this. Sort of, Wait a second. I know you from church. I know you from this group. I know you from the neighborhood. You know, okay, I'll do it. I'll take the survey. So we found that that was, that was really a, a good call. And we, we were happy that we went that direction. So let me jump back to that case study. Remember context. So at the end of November, 2023, we were notified that the state had received an official objection from Carter Spectrum related to the Rural Middle Mile Network Project by Golden State Connect Authority, GSCA. So the GSCA is a joint powers authority comprised of 40 rural California counties designed for the purpose of increasing access to reliable, affordable, high-speed internet for the residents and businesses of those counties. Basically, the GSCA is an organization, a joint powers authority that was going to be responsible for putting in a middle mile broadband network, a middle mile fiber network for rural and underserved communities, of which Guadalupe was identified. Carter Spectrum gave an official objection to that, basically because, quote, well, Information demonstrates the charter can provide broadband service in the project area with service far exceeding the minimum speed threshold set forth in the FFA program guidelines, meaning we already do it. We do it really well. We don't want competition here. So. Out of the 922 question respondents for that, we received the following information. Almost 75% said their connection speeds were met. Uh, the, their connection speed needs were met. 25% said, no, yeah, they were not met. And to, uh, a little over 2% said connection speed was met sometimes. Reliability, 70% needs were met. 31%, almost 32% said they were not met. Almost 2% said the reliability needs were met sometimes. But again, I keep saying the word, Context. While those numbers out of context can picture the support spectrum's objection that they already adequately service the area, the deeper dive into the survey responses paints a slightly different picture. Eight out of 15 districts had 30% or more respondents complain that connection speed did not meet their needs. 10 out of 15 districts had 30% or more respondents complain that reliability did not meet their needs. And you can see by this map, it's probably easier for you in printed copies. But this map has little thumbtacks that show the dis dissatisfaction and reliability dissatisfaction. The spread of discontent can be presented in a visual format using a district map overlay. There were a few areas all adjacent to each other that reported satisfactory services. Dissatisfaction over speed and reliability would, were much more widespread across the city. It could certainly be argued that while there are existing services throughout the city, it does not appear to meet the needs of many of the population. So that's where context comes in. And I don't know about most of you, but uh, if I had a business where at least a third of my customers thought I was too slow or I was too unreliable, I wouldn't be in business very long. So in conclusion, I know some of you are saying yes, finally. <laughs> so while broadband appears to be available, more so than the public comments might lead one to believe the speed and reliability of the provided services do appear to be an issue. While there are some areas in the city that appear to be just fine, almost three quarters of the city harbors fairly significant issues with the incumbent service provider. 10 of 15 reporting districts had at least 20% of respondents dissatisfied with speed. In fact, seven of those districts had dissatisfaction levels as high as 40%. Even more telling was that 12 of the 15 districts surveyed had at least 20% of the respondents unhappy about reliability. Four of those districts had up to 50% of all respondents reporting dissatisfaction with reliability. 
When significant numbers of the population are dissatisfied with the service level of incumbents, it becomes obvious that alternative solutions need to be explored. It is also readily apparent that even if people use a broadband service, they may not understand the basic terms that they are using and paying for. This educational issue becomes more glaring when respondents do not have a connection. This leads us to believe that educational opportunities to pertain to basic uh, pertaining to basic connectivity would benefit the community. Um, and as a side note, just basic technology in general seems to be something that the community has interest in. Finally, future services. According to all respondents, there was significant desire to consider the provisioning of internet services as a public utility. This, uh, this may certainly provide insight to the county and state as to what solutions might be the best fit for it rural community and as means of an update um <clears throat> so knowing that the, the the city's current resources could not fund uh a four or five person staff and the build out of a of an isp an internet service provider the city would have to look at working with other communities or other organizations um, within the county to provide said services. Uh, we have been in touch with SPCAD, and there are two models, there, oh, there's more than two models, but two uh, models in particular that we've talked about. And both of them, one is based out of Ammon, Idaho, one is based out of uh, uh, Utah. Their models, we're not talking about using their services. But what these models do is they essentially create a network, a fiber network throughout the community. And then these fiber lines, the high capacity internet communication lines are leased out to companies. This provides an opportunity for competition. In places like, like Utah or Idaho, where they have these types of, of businesses in place, most of you here that are paying full pop for basic internet service through Charter Spectrum are probably paying between $100 to $150 a month ballpark. That's if you're not bundling with phone or TV plans. And for that, you get about 100 megs down and maybe 15 megabytes upload speed. So your download speed is faster than your upload speed, but you're about 100 to 15, that's your ratio. And so you're paying, like I said, between 100 to 150 bucks a month. In places like Ammon, Idaho, or places in Utah that utilize Utopia Network, the competition has allowed for pricing to have 10 times the download speed, 1,000 megs down, and 1,000 megs up for as low as 50 bucks a month. That's huge. That's a game changer, not just for people in the community. That's a game changer for businesses. That kind of thing that can revitalize manufacturing. It can revitalize industrial. It can it can revitalize retail. That's the kind of thinking that hopefully SBCAG will be able to to leverage into decision making at the at the county level. So. That said, just I want to take a, a quick second to say, say some thank yous. Um, so I'd like to extend my thanks to the Santa Barbara Foundation to make the survey a reality. Also, thanks to Los Amigos de Guadalupe, the Broadband Consortium Pacific Coast, the Guadalupe Business Association, the Guadalupe Coalition of Nonprofits, obviously the City of Guadalupe, and other organizations who helped share the information about the survey and to make it possible. A special thank you to the Family Service Agency who stepped into fiscal agency partway through and allowed us to cross the finish line. And the following individuals also deserve to be singled out for their assistance throughout the process. Petra Amaro, Rubai Estes, Liz Tatsaya, Shelby Arthur, Lisa Bravo, Marcelia Ascension, Bill Bartels, and AIPR. So, any questions? What's our next step? Uh, next step, uh, we look forward to hearing the results of SPCAG's uh, discussion with the state. And uh, we'll know more at that point. Uh, Fred Luna over at SPCAG, with them, 
and they were looking I he couldn't give an absolute hopefully they were going to get uh they're going to get feedback on whether or not the data that we were able to provide uh would help with the objection that uh, charter spectrum presented there is no official notification that the state provides apparently it's just whether or not it moves forward or not and they were told possibly april but it may get bumped out to june so we're in a holding pattern until we get more information okay questions from the staff or council what's the difference between broadband and fiber <laughs> so uh broadband is more of a general term broadband encompasses both cable coax copper wire uh dsl uh and fiber so the the bigger differentiation is between say cable and fiber charter spectrum provides cable services that's copper wires metal fiber optics and which is why it's so much faster they're actually strands of glass and information is sent via light pulses so you're actually getting information roughly the speed of light versus electrical electromagnetic pulses thank you all right good information i know this we can so we're getting moving forward with this so all right okay. thank you thank, thank you, you. Okay. thank you all right we'll go to item seven uh community participation i have a request to speak uh, gloria Villegas. Hi, my name is Gloria Villegas, Outreach Coordinator at the Guadalupe Dune. I'm here today to make some announcements on some events, community events that we will um, have approaching. One being this weekend, which is a Coastal Stories, and it is a multicultural event that will be held at the Red Barn, right behind the Cultural Center next to the Guadalupe Dune. Uh, this will be held at 11.30 to 3.30. It's going to be a really awesome event. Um, we will have um, a presentation um, specifically directed towards like multicultural celebrations and traditions, including um, a segment on like Native Americans. They'll be doing their like drumming tradition and a little description and introduction in um, the importance and how they use that to celebrate. Uh, we'll also be doing um, a portion on the Hispanic community, have some dancers there. They will also have a little introduction. So we, we're really trying to kind of tell a story through that presentation, which will ultimately um, be exactly what we are creating in our mini documentary to capture the voices of the community. And um, really, really uh, call for the, the stories um, in the community of all the different cultures that have made it what it is today. And um, we actually have um, some amazing people on our team and uh, they've created a AV booth. So what it is is basically like a photo booth, but it'll have a recording system available and um, people can come in or they can actually like schedule a time where they would like to record. And these stories, they can be um, any story, but um, what we've described it to be is kind of like um, the stories that your grandma would tell you that you cannot find on Google, right? Those are the stories that bring that uh, richness, that depth. And uh, we'll have, we have Don Charlie, who's going to be doing tacos and um, beans, rice, all the good stuff. And the Lions Club will be doing burgers and hot dogs, and we'll have activities available for the kids. And this is the first of uh, two big uh, community events that we'll be hosting for this specific project. And uh, also further uh, than this community event, it will be um, a, a citywide um, opportunity to really emphasize the importance of the dunes and how important it is to the community and um, really tell that story. So we invite you, I will have flyers out in the public. We, we welcome you, your family, your friends, anyone you know who um, would like to get involved, who you think 
should be interviewed. Uh, we, we definitely have some key players already scheduled for interviews, but we welcome everyone in the community to come on by, um, enjoy some food, enjoy some entertainment, and um, tell your story. So hope to see you there. Uh, Saturday, the Red Barn behind the Cultural Center, right next to the Dune Center, is where it will be held. And um, there may be some rain projected, so just an FYI, it is indoors, so you'll have coverage and we'll be set. Um, <clears throat> I would also like to just announce uh, for next month, we will be doing a coastal cleanup. Uh, so excited that the Guadalupe Beach is now open. So we are planning uh, to do a coastal cleanup in partnership with a Earth Day. So we'll kind of combine it have some vendors out there and some other organizations within the same niche, uh, partnering to have uh, activities and information booths available while doing um, a, an actual coastal cleanup. It actually looks clean. It's so beautiful. <laughs> Everyone, <laughs> I'm sure, is really excited about that. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, that's what I have today. It's mainly just announcements. Uh, a lot of great things happening. Everyone's super excited. We got the beach open. And it seems to be the reoccurring theme today, uh, just, you know, hearing the voices of the community and telling the stories. And that's exactly, um, you know, what this project is all about, Coastal Stories. So we hope to see you there. Um, please get the word out. We'd love to, um, yeah, hang out with you. So. Thank, you. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Okay, thank you. We're going on item eight. I see no more, no more uh, requests to speak. Uh, item eight consent calendar. Oh, oh, I'm, I had one more. Okay. Oh, nice. Nice. <laughs> yeah. I promise it will be brief. Um, so I do know many of you, but for those that I haven't had the opportunity to meet, my name is Emily Dryling, and I am one of your Parks and Recreation Commissioners. And I'm here today to speak on behalf of the renaming of what is currently known as Central Park. Excuse me, that's on it's 14. It's on the agenda. It's on the agenda. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, now we'll go to uh, the consent calendar. Is there any uh, staff member or council member who wishes to pull an item on the agenda for further discussion? <clears throat> no. Okay. Now, do we have a motion to approve the consent calendar? I'll move to approve the consent calendar. Is there a second? A second. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. Go to management reports, uh, city administrative report. Thank you, Mayor and Council, staff, public at large. Um, now that um, Hannah is departing, we have a new um, recreation services manager here sitting here today. Um, her name is Anise Baratis, and I probably botched that. Uh, and I always do. It's the Norwegian in me. Um, so I just want to introduce you to her. And do you want a few words? A few words? We're excited. I am very excited to join um, the city of Guadalupe and serve the community as your recreation service manager. And I thank you so much for having me tonight. Good. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. And it's for us. Ross. For us. <laughs> Everyone else is there, right? No problem. Just yeah, right. right. Um, also, mayor and council, um, just a reminder that on Saturday, June 8th, the mayor is aware of this, and he's going to be jogging that day on June 8th. It's called the Peace Run. Beach torch run, um, and it's a celebration of peace. It's well in advance of that, but I wanted to keep it fresh in your mind. Also, since Larry's here, um, we couldn't convince and work through UC Santa Barbara's Bren program. Um, has they've decided that they cannot do the uh, climate action plan for us, so we're searching other other ways of trying to get it less expensive. And he's got some ideas too. Yeah, I I just recently um, contacted. Um, the professor that's working on our housing element. Uh, they have a similar program in uh, at Cal Poly at UCSB. And um, uh, I just today posed a question to them if they might be interested in, in taking this on. So I 
got the blessing from Santa Barbara County to do that because they're the ones that have the money. So um, we'll find out hopefully in the next uh, week or so. And if they are, then we'll pass the work program along to them and see if they want to bid on it. Okay. Thank you. Sir. Also on April 4th at 10 o'clock at City Hall, we're going to do the, or we're not going to, um, the pinwheels are going to be planted. And there's, I think, one for every, not sure, there's going to be about three, yeah, five. Well, anyways, it's um, pretty impressive and it really decorates the City Hall, but it's more importantly, it's um, for our children and for trafficking and that kind of thing to recognize those that are being moved. Also, um, Dave and Thomas is our new um, grant writer for Townsend because uh, Christine Rose has left. And so far, he's been doing really well. He's helping us put together a grant for the Senior Center. Um, and I know Christina mentioned we had this deadline. And so somehow we were able to get a project in the queue for uh, a free application that's due April 1st. So right now, we're compiling information for him to then incorporate that into the free application. We don't know what that project's going to be, but we have data on it. and. It's upwards of $2 million. Um, so I want you to know that. Also, April 16th from 12 to 6 here in the Chambers, APCD um, will be providing and giving out um, replacement air filters. It's a giveaway. So just be aware of that. There, I think there's a flyer that's going to go on the utility bill. Um, also, I found out today that we got an extension on Central Park for the deadline for the construction of the project. And that uh, goes through uh, 2028. Hopefully, we can get on it quicker than that. But it's nice to just have that flexibility, 2028. And that uh, concludes my report. Questions? Uh, any comments? I have a comment, I think, for the pinwheels for awareness. Thank you, Ms. Guadalupe. Um, they will be planting 395 pinwheels. These numbers represent one in five child abuse investigations in the Santa Maria area. Region since 2023. I knew you clarify that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So any questions or talk? Okay, we'll go on to uh, Director of Public Safety, Chief Cash. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, Council staff, and our community. Uh, first and foremost, um, I'd like to show appreciation to our artists here. Um, I've seen this work, it's, it's outstanding. And one thing I can tell you, the murals that we do have around town, it does decrease our graffiti. And we see that bridge all the time. And I understand the legal aspect of it, but man, uh, that would be a, an awesome project. So uh, thank you for kind of bringing that forward. We really appreciate that. Um, the other part is uh, right now, uh, public safety is working uh, a couple of long-term code compliance issues um, dealing with homes. Um, and we're, uh, we'll be eventually presenting our, our information to our city attorney. Um, we're looking at problematic homes that we keep going back to. Um, there's provisions to be charging for police services uh, if it becomes incumbent on us on, on regular type of um, call. These are uh, some long-term cases that we're working. Um, and so it's, um, we'll, we'll put more information out in the future, but uh, it's just, just something to kind of really be aware of. And the last part, um, I'm um, very honored to, to be able to put out today that um, on Wednesday, April 3rd, um, at the Guadalupe Social Club, um, the city will be uh, presenting an exceptional public service award to Mr. Kevin Foster. So um, he's um, agreed to come to Guadalupe. He's pretty excited with that aspect. Um, and so we'll, we'll have that. Uh, the staff has done an amazing job. Park and Rec and everybody else here, I mean, with their stepped up and admin and and uh, you know we appreciate the guidance that we've had from uh, from some of our council, uh, but to make this happen is huge. And just the comments that he stated on um, I I am not the historian of this city, but I just was able to say a few movies that were here. And first comments he goes, 
maybe that's a location for a movie. I'm like, wow, okay, mm -hmm. this can work out pretty nice. So that's uh, that was a nice coup, and I appreciate staff who have just been bent over backwards, and our community uh, who they're putting out and donating services and time to be able to make this happen. So this is pretty exciting. And uh, we will talk more about this as, as we kind of go further along um, as we put, put the finishing touches on that. So Can you explain why you have to raise getting the uh, yeah. Yeah. athletes? Yeah. Yes. Um, this goes back to um, last year, 2023, where we had the flooding here in Guadalupe and we had over 50 residents um, that were forced out of their home. We brought the residents here to City Hall um, because at the time we did not have a designated emergency shelter. And um, with that, we were calling late nights with our rec people just to get the gym open. Um, but we didn't have really lights. We didn't have heat. We didn't have water. We didn't have food source. And it was pretty dire to bring the people in here. Um, we had a Red Cross trailer. That was our only aspect of emergency preparedness. Um, and in the night hours during the rain, we had staff putting equipment and putting together diapers and uh, uh, cots so that we can at least give people some sense of safety uh, as we huddle them here. With that, we, we brought that information to uh, 1805, which is a group that was gathered down in San, San, Santa Barbara area after they had their floods and fires and mudslides. Uh, that was a huge loss of life. They put together concerts to raise money for first responders for equipment that cities normally could not afford. And we brought forth the idea about getting a generator. They had this... Uh, concert, Mr. Ke uh, or, um, uh, Mr. Costner's property and raised a lot of money for public agencies, uh, first responders throughout the entire county of Santa Barbara. We put in and asked for grant money and we were granted uh, at least $50,000 for a generator. And then the city council kicked in the other. So we'll be getting an $80,000 generator that will house here at City Hall that will be able to uh, provide for the entire building. And now we can really have an evacuation center. Mr. Costner helped to put that together, not only his property, but really spoke up in our behalf. And so we would like to honor him for sticking up for our city uh, to be able to now have a generator and which will be the first generator in our city and be able to make now a proper evacuation center for our community. Thank you. Anything else? Questions? Question? Thank you, Chief. No questions. I did meet a board member for 1805 and he was going to put it in the public. Okay. Thanks, Chief. Okay, item uh, 11, interim interim resource management. Uh, I lost my report. I'm giving it. How did I find it? Okay. 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 Uh, I do want to mention that uh, we did hire a uh, full time HR manager. Her name is Sylvia Estrada. Started last Monday, the 18th. Unfortunately, she wasn't able to make it tonight. She will be here uh, at the next meeting. And all future meetings thereafter, as well as closed session. <laughs> and uh, every place else, the financial manager needs to be. Okay, uh, very briefly, uh, recruitment. We have public safety. Uh, the police officer candidate that I mentioned in prior council meetings, with building backgrounds, uh, that hasn't been completed yet. No, not yet. Yeah. 
uh, recreation. Uh, this is after the fact. Anif Baraha is here. And the junior center uh, activity coordinator. We posted the position. We have received applications. So we are still receiving applications. I phone screen. I scheduled four things to occur. Um, when I called four to answer, so I phone screen two. Uh, we're still continuing the activity. And Sylvia Charlie is taking that over uh, quite nicely. In HR, I said she uh, started last uh, Monday and, and is doing quite well. Uh, we're, we're very pleased. In Public Works, uh, the Public Works Director, this initial was posted. Uh, recruitment continues on that. Maintenance Worker 1, uh, we have selected a candidate and uh, all the processes actually have been completed. And he will be starting on April 2nd. The new position uh, that was approved last council meeting, grants administrator, that has been uh, posted. Starting with on that, and yesterday, uh, Sylvia already received a uh, resume. And uh, I did ask, I had to see the resume, if any, anyone, any of them look uh, right, well, she said, yeah, so we were pleased with that. Labor, labor relations, and the uh, negotiations with fire were ongoing. With this comp, there was one injury um, and two long term outstanding claims that are still being monitored. Uh, the one injury was since we are first day, nothing serious at all. The plan is continuing uh, to update the HR file. They will be completely updated in uh, the matter of weeks. Uh, and one critical thing I wanted to mention it hasn't been uh, scheduled yet, but one of the first training sessions that uh, I suggested that Sylvia coordinate with JKA is preventing discrimination and harassment in the workplace. That hasn't been scheduled in quite some time. Uh, we're obligated to do so every two years. And I do know we're behind on that. So that is one of the things that uh, we will um, just get this to an end on site uh, as opposed to the uh, online private training. It's far better with this subject. That is my last HR. Are you sure about that? <laughs> yeah. 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 Do we need to do one more? One more meeting? Yeah. Next item is public hearing. Uh, consider amendments to the subdivision ordinance title 17, 1717.32.030 by the municipal code. Larry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, Council Members. Good evening. Staff is bringing ordinance amendment this evening to fix the problem with our subdivision ordinance, which is chapter 17 of the <laughs> well municipal code. Over the years, you've seen staff bring a number of ordinance amendments for the zoning ordinance, but this is the first time we've done it for the subdivision ordinance, and it's um, about 50 years old now, and so it really does need some work. But um, while we plan to do a major update uh, later this year, um, we felt it was necessary to do this evening because we do have a map that is being processed, and I can't record because it's inconsistent with uh, with our ordinance. Um, the previous ordinance, as you can see from the staff report, showed that you had to have a minimum 60 foot wide um, or a 6,000 square foot lot minimum with a 60 foot uh, frontage. Um, because of the number of changes that have occurred either through our general plan update or through state regulation, um, we had to make changes to those. And so the, the request we put in is that you would allow for the minimum lot size to be 3,630 square feet, which is consistent with the uh, one to 12 units per acre for the R1 zoning, which was approved in the in the general plan update and then also um, through the consistency rezone. So we've prepared ordinance number 2024-517 to implement the project. Tonight's the first reading. We, if it goes forward, then we would continue this to April 9th for the second reading, and then 30 days after that, it could go into effect. The applicant's project would be able to be um, recorded. So that's what we're asking. Yeah. Can't see the clock. Is it 715? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. At 715, we'll open this up to public uh, comment. Public is a public hearing. <clears throat> is there anyone in the audience that wishes to speak on this on this matter? Seven 
16, we'll close the public hearing. Uh, is there a motion? Is there any questions of uh, uh, this topic? Okay, is there a motion to approve? Uh, uh, introduced by Ty Loli and waive the first reading of ordinance number 2024-517. And I'll read the whole thing. Amending section 17.32.030 of the Guadalupe Municipal Code and continue the April 9, 2024, the second reading of adoption. Is there a motion to that effect? I vote to approve uh, the waiver of the first reading for ordinance number 2024 that. By Is there a second? I'll second that. Any discussion? Well, that roof will roll. Call, please. Council Member Costa Jr. Aye. Council Member Rollis. Aye. Council Member Fernandez. Aye. Council Member Fernandez. Mayor Julio. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. <clears throat> Do you need a break? Yep. Okay, uh, we'll go a five minute uh, biological.
Thank you. The next item is uh, regular business. Uh, item 13, approving hiring a bond financial team for the Weather Bay yeah. Royal Theater Renovation Project. Mr. Bodum. Okay, thank you, Mayor, Council, uh, staff, and community at large. Um, just get to the point. Um, it, it is recommended that the City Council adopt the resolution approving the hiring of a bond financing team, Jones Hall, and also Wolf Hansen and Company, who is the municipal advisor. And that's uh, Steve Gortler. And then there's James, as far as the bond council, will be providing a presentation tonight. But I'll give a, just a brief uh, discussion and then we'll send it over to, uh, to those guys. So over the past five years, the city has diligently worked to raise the vast majority of funding needed for the Royal Theater project, renovation project. In total, the city has secured or is in the process of securing more than 10 million in grants and other financing. These consist of the following anticipated sources, Economic Development Administration, EDA grant, 4.8 million. California Arts Council, CAC, is a $5 million grant. And then historic tax credits, about eight to $900,000. Final cost estimates are not yet available, but the city believes the additional approximately 3 million and potentially up to 5 million is required to ensure the project can be completed as designed. The timeline for obtaining the funding is running short as the 4.8 million EDA grant will expire if construction is not started by, somebody corrected this, I put March, 2024, it's actually March, 2025, so I apologize for that. Give us a little more time. After exhaustively exploring, exploring all options, the city believes placing a bond measure on the November 24 ballot now represents the best option to ensure the funding for the project is in place in a timely manner. To put a bond measure on the November 24 ballot, specialized consultants are required. Jones Hall Professional Law Corporation would serve as the bond counsel to the city, drafting resolutions and other required legal documents with review by the city attorney. Wolf Hansen and Company would serve as a municipal advisor to the city, analyzing tax rate, bond interest rate, and related matters. These firms have provided the following fee proposal to the city, Jones Hall 10,000 and Wolf Hansen and Company 5,000. In addition to these consultants, the Santa Barbara County Election Department would charge the city an additional fee to place the measure on the November ballot around $5,000. Once the financing team is hired, they can work with city staff to further analyze potential bond measure and bring back to the city council additional action items. The professional services agreement for these consultants will be submitted to the city council for approval at a future council meeting. These additional actions are anticipated to occur in June and July in order to meet the statewide deadlines for the November 24th um, election. So in total, the, what could be budgeted for the 24-25 fiscal year budget would be 20,000. If this passes, then the bond issuance will cover it, reimburse the general fund for those costs. So it's not going to hit the uh, this year's fiscal year or this fiscal year budget. So with that, if you, uh, without further ado, if you want them to take the yes. and get provided presentation, James and uh, Steve. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. Good evening. Hi. Um, you guys doing okay? Yeah, um, I'm Steve. This is Jane. As um, as I uh, mentioned, I'm a financial consultant, an attorney. We provide the various services related to these types of project financings. I'm going to call pretty quickly because a lot of the information that we have to say, you guys will know a lot of oh, it. Yeah. Uh, the public is saying they can't hear you. Oh, oh. really? Just keep it up a little bit. There you go. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Is that better? Oh. Is that better? Yes. All right. So uh, I'm not going to repeat what I said, but we'll just keep going. Um, if you could skip ahead another. Um, so a little bit on the project itself, which I'm sure many of you know a lot, a lot about already. Um, the theater revitalization project. It's got a couple of components to it. A renovation of the existing theater. As you know, I'm sure it's shuttered. It's boarded up right now in disuse. Um, the theater itself, a 5,000 square foot, 230 theater will be completely renovated and I've seen you know what's supposed to look like quite beautiful when it's done. In addition, some new facilities will be constructed on the state of the art performing arts center for hosting live stage productions, live musical events, community events, um, educational and cultural programs for children in schools in, in the city as well. 
in addition, additional facilities, green room, classroom, meeting spaces, and so forth. It's really envisioned as a um, as a beautiful project, very large, very broad in scope. Um, I think it's going to provide an enormous amount of, of um, opportunities for recreation and culture in the city. In addition to, um, it's it's obviously located in a very strategic location um, down down the street. Um, it should um, bring people into town. That should revitalize some of the commercial establishments in the area, generate some foot traffic, some business opportunities, and so forth. So it's got a lot of value, a lot of um, benefits. It, it, it should really be a, a bright a star um, for the downtown. Our next page. Um, on the financial aspect of it, um, as Todd mentioned, and this is really worth emphasizing, the project costs are still being finalized, but it's estimated that it'll cost somewhere between, say, 10, uh, excuse me, 12 and $14 million. Already, the city, through its efforts, has secured approximately $10 million, or three quarters of the project's cost, in grant funds that don't have to be repaid. Here's a grant, $10 million, apply it to the project. So the cost of financing the project that the city or its taxpayers will have to bear is probably only about two, three, four million dollars, maybe one quarter of the project cost. That's a, a unique opportunity. We don't really see that very often where somebody else is going to pay for your project and you're only going to pay a quarter of the cost. Um, as you can see, some of the grant programs are listed on the on the slide there. I don't need to repeat those for you. Um, so I, mean, I think that's just probably one of the most important aspects of the financial um, uh, cost of the project is the grant funding and the tremendous efforts that the city has successfully made to obtain this grant. Um, James is going to talk a little bit about some of the bond aspects of this, the remaining financing that, that we're talking about. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, James Rosiniak at Joan Hall. We're a bond council firm uh, based in San Francisco. Nice to be with everyone tonight. Um, as Stephen mentioned, uh, you know, the city's efforts have procured most of the funding needed for the project. But the city reached out to us as experts in municipal finance and said, we have this gap. Is there a way to fill it? And we said, yes. What cities often do when there's a gap in a project is they can issue tax-exempt bonds. So it's a little bit like your mortgage, right? You have a project, you have a house you want to buy, you take out a mortgage, which means you get the money up front and you pay it over time. Well, it's the same with a bond. Uh, the city would issue a bond and get the money up front, help pay for the project, and pay it back over time. And there's different kinds of bonds. There's different repayment sources, essentially. And we'll go through that on the next slide. But this slide is really focusing on the advantages of tax-exempt bonds, which only municipalities um, are able to do. So you, again, go out and get a mortgage on your uh, house. Uh, you're paying a taxable rate. You know, no one, the bank has got to pay um, taxes on the interest that they receive. But an investor in a city bond does not pay taxes on that bond, which means they're willing to give you a lower interest rate so that's a better economic benefit. And that's just a benefit for local agencies like cities that essentially the federal government, the Congress has provided tax exemption for local agencies like city of Guadalupe to fund capital projects. The whole point is to allow lower cost financing of capital projects for five cities. So um, that's where we come in, we specialize in tax exempt bond financing, making sure it's legal, making sure that it fits within the tax exemption rules so that you, you as a city could issue that lower interest rate, you know, the lowest possible cost of borrowing. As it says on the slide, um, you know, generally cities, municipalities are pretty good credit. Um, the interest rates are relatively low because they're pretty stable. You know, local government is pretty stable, uh, more uh, credit worthy than just uh, an average person um, seeking a loan. And then the repayment term, it's like 25 to 30 years. So again, it's kind of similar to your mortgage. Get that money up front, pay it back uh, annually over 25 or 30 years. Next slide. Uh, as I mentioned, there's multiple different kinds of tax exempt bonds that cities like the city of Guadalupe could uh, undertake. Uh, the one we're gonna focus on tonight is the general obligation bond. Uh, school districts are also able to do general obligation bonds. The school districts here in the community have successfully gone to voters, gotten passage of general obligations, and financed their public school facilities. So it's something that's familiar in the community, uh, and and cities are able to do it as well. Um, special tax bonds, partial tax bonds, sales tax bonds, 
as the name implies, it's kind of what's the source of repayment? So the general obligation bond, the source is going to be uh, a general obligation of the city, which is really the taxpayer and ad valorem property tax. Okay, so that's what a general obligation bond is. There's an additional ad valorem, meaning based on the property value, higher property value pays higher amount, lower sub value, property value pays lower amount. Uh, that's the general obligation bond versus a parcel tax it can be just a flat you know, tax for parcel sales tax would, of course, be based on sales taxes generated in the city uh, as a more residential kind of smaller city. You're not generating a lot of sales taxes. It's going to be hard to, you know, bond against that revenue stream. Um, lease revenue bonds uh, would be uh, really a general fund obligation. So you look at the city's excess. If there is any excess general fund dollars, right, and say, hey, we're going to bond against that. Obviously, that, that's Problematic is challenging for, for smaller cities uh, like the city of Guadalupe. There's not a lot of excess funds already around. Um, and so again, as, as the slide concludes, you know, our recommendation, what makes sense from where we sit, what we see with other cities across the state would be the general obligation bond. And we'll so we'll get into some more of the details of that. Right. So and you know, we trust the other cost. Who's going to pay for it? How much it's going to cost? Or how long? I mean, if it didn't cost anything, then we wouldn't even be talking about it. You'd be building it. So this is really the you know the gist of the matter. Even though two million dollars is coming from grant programs or from grant funds, that three million dollars is going to have to be repaid with interest every year over time for say thirty years. So it's a considerable expense. Um, right now we're still sort of trying to refine the numbers. Um, so we're giving you a range of costs as best we can. Right now, it looks like the annual cost um, from all of the taxpayers in the city would be roughly between $125,000 and $300,000 per year, every year for 30 years. Now, that number will get refined, and eventually we'll get it down to an exact amount in the next month or two, perhaps, um, and we'll give you more precise estimates. But right now, the cost of the project is still undergoing you know, review and study, and so we're giving you ranges to give you a sense of you know what the outcomes might look like. As as James said, this would be paid. There would be an additional amount that would be placed on the property tax bill that every parcel owner in the city receives every uh, I guess October November time frame that you pay your property taxes in December and April. This would be another line item on that bill. You pay another you know another amount. Um, let's see. So um you know based upon our analysis, the preliminary estimate. Or that at the very low end, um, it will be between yeah, yeah, one step. So if you own a home, you might have bought that home, you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago. It may be having an assessed value for property tax purposes of one or two or three hundred thousand dollars. And that's the basis that your property taxes are assessed. Alternatively, you may have bought a house, you know, six days ago at five hundred thousand dollars. And so that property might have a, an assessed value of five hundred thousand dollars. Our sort of you know back of the envelope estimates are that the average home or maybe the median home in the city is on the tax rolls at an assessed value of approximately three hundred thousand dollars. Now the market value of that home may be more, maybe less. The assessed value is currently around three hundred thousand um, dollars. Uh, for this bond issue that we're talking about, the cost of repayment each year would be roughly between eighteen and forty-three dollars. Per one hundred thousand dollars, per one hundred thousand dollars of assessed value. So for a home with an assessed value of three hundred thousand dollars, call that the median homeowner in the city, the annual cost on their property taxes would be roughly between fifty-four and one hundred and twenty-nine dollars per year, every year for thirty years. Again, that could be narrowed down once we have a better sense of what the actual cost of the project is. But that's what we're talking about for a typical homeowner, of which there are thousands, of course. You know, and, and many homeowners have higher assessed values, many have lower assessed values. Commercial properties are going to have another, you know, different assessed value. So everybody's going to pay a slightly different amount. But, you know, we try and sort of talk about the big picture. On the average, a homeowner, $54 to $129 per year on their tax roll every year. And it'll be a fixed amount, and it probably won't change very much from year to year. Um, before I go on questions on that, I mean, that's, that's always kind of the crux of the matter. No, so fine, no. so, <laughs> all right, yeah, keep going. Um, so you know, uh, this is kind of obvious, but you know, these these um these bond issues we're talking about 
um, they have to be approved by the voter. Um, roughly, um, you know, uh, uh, two thirds of the voters have to vote to approve the issuance of the bond. And it's quite often the case where communities, whether it's cities or school districts or other types of um, municipalities, in order to successfully get a bond issue passed by the voters, they need to do a very uh, substantial public outreach effort. Um, oftentimes, they form a citizens committee to reach out into the public, to educate the public, to advocate on behalf of the project and on behalf of the bond issue. And we just wanted to put this up there to kind of give you a sense about what some of the efforts are that are commonly made that produce a positive, a successful bond election. Um, you know, writing letters to local newspapers, posting lawn signs, and all the things that you see all the time, whenever there's an election, whether there's a ballot initiative or a candidate, it's all the same stuff. Um, only it's geared towards this project. And, and, and really, it, it makes a big, big difference in the success of these types of things. The more people know about the project, the more they know about the, you know, the, the benefits of the project, the more likely they are to come out and support it. In this case, it, it's a little bit more complex in the sense that you've got this $10 million grant proceeds, and you're only looking to borrow three out of the 13 million. You know, in my mind, that's a hugely important aspect of the whole thing. That's a little complicated too. To get that message out, it's gonna require a little extra effort as well. So I just wanted to kind of bring that to your attention at the forefront. So, you know, you've got lots of time to think about that. Um, and then, yeah, so a uh, little just a proposed schedule here. If the council is interested in, in moving forward, um, as the city administrator said, I mean, we could get hired by the city, uh, work with the city staff to kind of bring forth the resolutions and, and documents and numbers that it would take to actually get this on the ballot. Uh, you can sort of see the outline there. It requires two additional city council meetings under the government code provisions to authorize a general obligation bond. Uh, we would bring one action in June, another action in July, uh, in order to meet that August 9th, you know, countywide deadline, you know, essentially that August 9th is the countywide deadline for anything to get out on the November ballot. Uh, and so we we would be targeting that, um, and that's the November 5th election day we're looking at. If we could get to the ballot, if the two thirds of the voters voted in favor, um, then we of course would have authorization to issue bonds for the city to finance this project. And we would envision that happening kind of in the beginning of next year, uh, January, February, in order to meet that March 2025 deadline on um, grant funding mm -hmm. that, that otherwise expires. So uh, as we said, and just to reiterate, you know, it does require two-thirds um, voter approval. Um, a general obligation bond districts actually are able to approve their bonds with 55%. It's a different part of the constitution that they rely on. 55% uh, gets the school district, their geo bond cities require two-thirds. Uh, and even before we get there, the June and July actions you know, you require two thirds of the count to move in favor of uh, each of those uh, actions. So essentially four out of five. And I think, you know, this makes sense. Um, something the whole city really needs to get behind. Uh, it's a pretty big lift to get that two thirds approval. Uh, and so it starts with the count. Mm -hmm. Well, last page, uh, just to emphasize one point, though, you know, tonight, you're, you're really, the goal here tonight is not to authorize the issuance of the bond. This is really just a, sort of the first step in a multi-step process. There will come meetings down the road where there will be an action item on the agenda to actually move forward with the issuance of the bond. This really is more to start the process of preparing the material that will be used to authorize the issuance of the bond. But as a threshold matter, you know, there needs to be enough interest to move forward to even take the first step. Um, in terms of the cost, you know, in addition to the cost to the homeowners and so forth, there's the cost to the city for this whole effort. I just wanted to go through that in the interest of transparency. You know, we're, we're um, going to provide some uh, consulting services, some legal services, financial services to get this whole process moving forward up to the point of placing the bond measure on the ballot, you know, in the proper manner, you know, come November, if that should be the will of the council. Um, so for the services that will be provided between now and then, legal counsel will charge the city $10,000, our firm will charge the city $5,000. The county, in order to put the measure on the ballot, will also charge the city an amount. I don't have an exact amount, but we're estimating it between three and five thousand dollars if you put it on the November ballot, because that's a general election. So those are the costs that you'll incur just to get to the, you know, sort of the, the vote. 
Um, if the vote should be in favor of issuing the bond, if you go that far, and then you go forward with the issuance of the bond, that's a whole nother process of legal and financial of uh, you know consulting service and so on and so forth. And there are you know considerable costs associated with that as well. Um, we've estimated um, uh, you know, we've made a list of what those various services are, legal, underwriter, advisor, insurer. These are all sort of the standard fair costs that every bond issue has to incur. Um, and we've estimated that there to be roughly about $160,000 that would be incurred if you should actually go forward and issue the bonds. That would be tacked on to the $3 million or so that you borrow from the bonds and paid from the bond proceeds rather than from the city's own coffers. It's a large demand. You know, that's why we put it out here because we want you to know about that in advance. Um, bond issues are costly. The fact that this is only a $3 million bond issue, it doesn't really drive down the cost of issuing the bond issue. This is a five or 10 or $15 million bond issue. It would still be about $150,000. There's a certain amount of cost that you incur for doing this work. And it's not really driven by the by the size of the bond issue. At, at a much larger bond issue, of course, it would go up. But I wanted to put that in context. Um, so that's that's what we've got to say. Um, I need to take questions. You know, uh, this whole process, and we we probably meet uh, with uh, Tom Bradbury and, and others two three times a week. It's like uh, sausage making. You you don't want to see the process because it's pretty ugly. It's just a lot. Going, you know, going on, yes. and uh, one, two things. Uh, one is that uh, we don't really know the exact amount of the, the actual bill, so we know that it's going to be over, but we don't know how much it's going to be over. I know that uh, we haven't, had, we don't have that figure yet. No, um, the um, we're hiring an estimator to get us a little dialed in, but the actual crew cost will be when the bids come in. So that's when you'll you'll really get to know. And then the second thing is that. And in terms of community outreach, uh, the city cannot be involved in the actual processing of moving. We can't put signs up. We can't, and um, officially can't do anything with that. That's why you're talking about, you know, a, you know, a campaign outside the city, outside the city hall, in terms of uh, moving this uh, forward. So yeah, that's a very important point. Um, uh, the city is not allowed under the state laws to use city resources. Um, to advocate on behalf of a bond measure. Um, there are, you are permitted to do educational efforts to right. inform the public, but whether it's staff time or or, or um, city resources cannot be applied toward advocacy of the bond measure. And that's why these citizens committees, which are truly independent of the city right. um, and occur and, and operate outside the, you know, the purview of the city council are formed because there's active interest among the citizens to participate in the process to advocate for the project and for the bonds and so forth. And I think another item that's important is that with the EPA, the, the, the Fed, you have to have the money up front in order for that for us, for them to give the money. Yes. So we can't, we we say we don't have the full amount for the construction of yeah, if it's $12 million, that five that five million dollars is is not coming our way. So if we if we sit and wait and they and don't do anything, uh, it's it's going to hinder us in, in the sense that we may not get the ten uh, five million if we don't have this effort moving forward. And, and if you did a capital campaign and the timing of this, that would be almost to raise three million five million would be very difficult. We've looked into that mm -hmm. and other financing sources. And if this went to a vote, it would truly be a community project. Then if they voted for it, so that's the way I kind of look at this. And bonding is done all over and. I think when you look at the uh, the cost per home, it's not extraordinary. And I think also, um, I, I shouldn't say that in terms of the homeowners, they say I'm crazy. But at the same time, you can see the economic benefit of this and the multiplier effect of having a theater in there and how that'll draw more into the community, which will be an economic, I think, sevenfold for every dollar spent. So that'll help uh, restaurants, that'll help drive in new business, that'll help build the vacant uh, buildings. So for me, I did look at it in terms of my experience that that'd be an anchor for the community, which would draw in not only just from a financial standpoint, but also from a um, cultural standpoint. So it would be really, to me, it's a, we got a great return on our investment at 10 million, the two grants for 5 million. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I
now that in, in, in the terms of, of the legal counsel and the municipal advisor, you know, the 15,000 and we we'll just go forward with the county, there's another 5,000. Um, what are we, what, what are we getting for your counsel and the municipal and advisors in terms of what do we, what do we see in, on, in front of us in terms of paper? What are we going to look at? And are, are you doing any, uh, you know, digging into the, uh, the appraised values of the, of the, of the homes or what's, or the commercial areas? Uh, um, well, there's a couple of, that's a good question. There's actually quite a few sort of moving parts, if you will. Yeah. Um, I, I'll defer to James on all of the legal matters and you know, the ballot itself and so forth. From a financial consultant perspective, um, you know, they're trying to understand um, how much the bonds are going to cost the city, how that's going to impact on the taxpayers, um, you know, preparing the estimates, um, analyzing what the distribution will be among the various categories. There's commercial, there's residential, there's industrial, there's agricultural, you know, trying to understand who's going to pay how much. Um, um, and then, you know, from my perspective, all of the legal documents that are prepared, I review all those documents as well, make sure I understand them, make sure I agree with them, you know, uh, sort of another set of eyes on top of all the documents. Um, there's probably more to it, um, uh, but those are sort of the things that top of mind. Yeah, and I can jump in on the, on the legal side of things. Uh, as was shown on the schedule, we would be coming back to the city council for two meetings. There's a series of resolutions that would need to be adopted by the council to place the measure on the ballot. There's actually also an ordinance um, to place the measure on the ballot just under state law. Uh, of course, state law, that's in the government code. We also have to make sure we are complying with the California Constitution, which governs the, how general obligation bonds are uh, voter approved. And as many uh, probably know, there's actually a constitutional initiative uh, scheduled for the November ballot as well. It's called Initiative 1935. Uh, it would change a lot of provisions uh, regarding taxes and voter approval of taxes. Um, it's currently in litigation. The governor has, has uh, sued to keep it off the ballot, but the proponents want it on the ballot. So we're keeping track of that. We would, of course, help the city work through those issues and the impact uh, if that were to pass. Uh, and then, as I mentioned earlier, there's, there's, that's on the state law side. There's a whole federal tax law side analysis that we at Jones Hall undertake as well. Uh, we understand from Tom Bradbury that sort of, there's a nonprofit involved with the theater as well. So it's a successor agency owned property to be given to the city, the city owned, but also nonprofits involved. And we need to analyze that to make sure again, uh, the tax exemption rules are followed, which again are for the benefit of cities, municipalities, not you know private entities, nonprofits, that kind of thing. So that that's where we come in on the legal side. Um, the mayor, the mayor, and I have uh, met with Tom, and stuff, and there's also been discussions about well, don't scale the building, you know, make it smaller. Uh, but the why not build the building in a way that's for the community, that's robust, and the HVAC and the new has to support the old, the existing remodeling of the old has to stay the same. They're intertwined. AD accessibility has to go out to the back and access, not from the front, but from the new um, um, the, the new addition, which then has an elevator. So they're really intrins intrinsically put together and between the grant, so you got the complexity of two different types of grant. Um, the building itself is tied together as part and part of the board of together you know they have to be done together um this is just a way to access month funding quicker i think and making sure that the project gets completed uh which is part of the the council i know that, uh there are several uh individuals that wish to speak or have one of them is uh picture from well, you want to bring it up You'll be the third. Okay. Um, one of the things, and not in where sure is, uh, is, I'm going to, uh, can you read this? Yeah, sure. Um, so, so, um, surely, um, provided, surely Boyston provided a, worth reading, so an email and I'll read it out loud. Um, I strongly urge the council and any residents speaking tonight to carefully assess the proposal to contract with two firms to raise more funds towards the Royal Theater revitalization. 
If the bond proposal is agreed upon, that means 50 to $70 annually on homeowners property tax bills for the next 30 years, the usual life of a bond issue. Spending 15 to 20,000 to raise another five or more million for the theater project does not pencil out for property owners. Project has 10 million plus in hand now, so why not proceed in phases as has been done with Leroy Park and other projects. The 10 million plus will allow the upgrades, proper bathrooms, dressing rooms, and performers. The theater will then be ready to be rented for general use, speaker presentations, musical performances, dance programs, school graduations, and many other uses. The money from rentals, or maybe even the, at least, will add to the building funds for the second phase, the three-story building, and that, too, also requires a careful look. Allen Hancock College has a well-planned and accredited film program for college-age and adults. Why try to duplicate that here? And what is the need for a large kitchen? Lompoc City um, has a theater similar in size and age as, Royal, as the Royal. Citizens there have been working for 10 plus years to bring it to life. We should do the same. Fundraise to augment the rental revenue before going into further debt on a long range project when in, in a shorter time, the theater can be ready for use if slightly redesigned for the restoration in a shorter amount of time. That's it. Okay. Um, Professor uh, Romero, gentlemen, you can make, take a seat and then maybe you'll fire a question over at you. Well, good evening, Mayor, and welcome to Women for Now. Uh, glad to have you here. My name is Frances Romero. I'm a former mayor of Guadalupe, among many other positions I've held over the last 25 years, 27 years. I, I don't have anything eloquent to have prepared, but I have some random comments that I think you should consider. Um, I do not see that you've done any type of uh, voter sentiment survey. And you have some time to do that between now and June. You have an opportunity to have a consultant at some cost to do a random survey of your homeowners registered in both parties to see how people would look at a bond measure. If you're looking at really low numbers, maybe that gives you some pause. If you're looking at really high numbers, then yay. Um, Public outreach, that is going to be a citizen-driven exercise as you go forward with this. Uh, the fee, I guess it's a fixed fee that we're looking at for the $10,000. Knowing what attorneys cost, if they're charging $500 an hour, that's 20 hours of time for that 10 grand. Hopefully that's enough to get their work done. If it's 400 an hour, you're looking at 25 hours. So hopefully that is a fixed fee and you won't have any surprise costs coming up with that. Um, I do agree with some of what Shirley has to say, and I want to thank Todd for some information he provided me earlier today. Uh, there has to always be a backup plan. November's the election. You find out whether or not it happened. You've got some work. So what is the backup plan? And maybe it is having to scale back some of the more expensive amen amenities. So something to consider. Uh, Looking forward to seeing how this turns out. I do know that when you look at bond measures by themselves, it's only $10 a month. But then you look at the list of bond measures on your tax bill at the end of the year. And most of us have uh, very happily voted for pretty much everything that's come up for schools, and the list is pretty long. Uh, costs are not coming down, incomes are not rising. And inflation doesn't seem to be moving much either. So I would recommend doing some sort of voter sentiment. I can give you a couple of really good consultants that you could contact regarding that. And they are firms that can pick out a survey like that for you in probably less than a month. And you'd at least have some additional information to gauge community support. Thank you so much. Thank you. By the way, looking at value added, we even look like the whole picture in terms of say a, a, a stove in the kitchen. Do we need that right away? So looking at our design, uh, Andrew Goodman design, we're actually looking at what do we need right now so we can reduce the reduce the cost. Because there's some things you don't you don't need right away. There's other things you need right away. Just like that the first uh, EDA money is for the actual show itself, the theater. 
And in order for the VAC, for HVAC system, for everything else, the electrical system, you need that second portion, which is designed to house all the HVAC and everything else, the, the, the mechanical systems. So you can't just do one and not, not the other. You can't, uh, there, was a th there was a thought to, it's three story to eliminate uh, the, the third and the fourth story. Can't because it's, it's, it's part of the mechanical system. You can't just eliminate that because then you can't, you, can't, uh, you can't use the theater which from the EDA side of things because that's, uh, it's important to have, of course, mechanical HVAC systems, uh, everything else that you need still. So, um, Let's see, Mr. Nunes. <clears throat> Good evening. Uh, I wasn't going to speak tonight, but I um, hope my voice holds out. Uh, regarding this issue, um, I'll give you some boulder sentiment right now, some homeowner sentiment and a resident sentiment right now. But before I do, I got to tell you my my background in theater. Before I was disabled, I had a career um, in marketing and communication for several decades that was built on my experience in the theater. I've written, I've directed, I've had shows travel up and down the state, um, and. Uh, so my love and affinity for the art is, you know, is as high as you can go. We need them. I don't believe in a sentiment that if we build it, they will come. And uh, echoing the, the woman's uh, comments before me about you need some sort of data. You need data to support that building this huge, huge beautiful complex, which I totally would want. Um, needs more data to support it. Because while we talk tonight, while you talk tonight at the 30,000 level, the 30,000 feet level, I would just for a second bring it down to the depth channel. On my hand, I can count the number of seniors that have to pay, play pop stop with their check every month. I know a woman who doesn't get insulin all the time. She can't afford it. I know a group of a few seniors that have to pull their money and give money to me to go to Costco to buy stuff in bulk and then give it broken down so that they don't have to pay as much for me. That's the thoughts I think of when you say um, 54 to 129 dollars. That's not much. Well, yeah, in grand scheme of things, maybe. But for the senior center, senior citizen that living here all their lives and have maybe their house is paid off great and now their house is valued at what 400 500 000? so now they're caught they're partaking in this they're paying for this and it's what going to be two 200 out of their budget a month or whatever it is dollars you know these aren't just figures for going around they're they're actually well you know i don't need to say that anymore but anyway I just wanted to bring it down to the death pain level and uh, and for me to change my mind, because right now my vote is no on bond X, but to change my mind, I would really need to see what's the value added to the community, long range, short range. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Okay. Well, that was it. Any other any any other individual wish to speak on this item? Okay, come come to the council. Any uh, thoughts? This, uh, again, this is like um, making sausage. It's a tough one because there's a, a lot of moving parts. Um, I think uh, we have ten million bucks, ten million dollars. You don't get that every day. And personally, if if we don't. It's, it's probably going to come in more than uh, it's going to come in more than 10 million but I don't know how much uh, it's projected in, like it's talked about maybe 3 to 5 million that's a lot of money uh, where do you get that uh, you can't, can't have 
fundraisers aren't going to do it. You know, but look at Lompoc. I think Shirley mentioned Lompoc. It's taking years for them to, you know, to generate uh, resources to get that fixed. So, uh, discussion from the council. Sure. Um, Todd, what is the percentage of any Goodwin's plans are completed? Would you guess me? Um, I think he's about ninety percent. I think he's hundred percent complete. But there's been some desire to to amend them, you know, just based on from AV stuff. But for the most part, we had to use. Remember, we used funds from the the bond excess revenue to actually develop the plan. That then was that allowed us to get the grant. By providing those uh, civil engineering and architectural items, so yeah, the uh, actual uh, drawings are pretty pretty well complete. Yeah, they're pretty much done. I talked about value added, and one of the things was we were looking at that um, uh, the area, of, you know, a walking not the walking area, but the not the gazebo, but the, yeah, the amphitheater to eliminate that. Uh, that we don't know the cost specific cost. We, we do know that, is that uh, um, Andrew has that information. Yeah. I think it was unique with that because I think, the, I believe when we qualified for that, um, keeping the Royal Theater in that Art Deco 1939 um, front facade, but upgraded all the way through. So, I mean, just to tie that in, then everybody knows with the rising, uh, you know, cost of work, it's, 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 it's Exuberant, crazy, you know, but we got to take advantage of something with that money sitting. Yeah, and again, I mentioned that uh, the, the Fed's EDA is saying if you don't have the money up, if you don't have the money in the bank, you're not going to get the you're not going to get the five million. Um, I hate to lose that. Any comments, other? If you lose that, you lose the project. Yeah, you lose the project. I know um, a lot of time went into the design where we turned out was there, but as a community member and homeowner in here, it's like in just two years, we just passed two more bonds for them to build a new school. You know, price and materials and everything went on. And looking at everything, there are a lot of people in our community that are on a fixed income. You know, this kind of stuff is something that affects those individuals. And, you know, the Royal Theater is a historical landmark here in our town. And with all that, you know, I would love to see it be up and running and, you know, generating something. But the thing about it too is we need to start small. You know, we all look at the big picture of everything and it all looks nice, but what does it come down to? It comes down to money. And I've said it before, you know, we don't have a tax revenue. Our tax revenue is very limited to what we can do. You know, we don't have a lot of people coming through here. I mean, if we can set up to do this in phases, like we did Leroy Park, you know, it would be nice. Um, another thing is, you know, we still haven't got any thing knowing when they're gonna start doing commercial land right here in front of Pasadena. That's land sitting there with tax revenue that could be generated to help where we wouldn't have to put another bond on, on the measure to have our taxpayers paying for that. <clears throat> I just think there's things that we need to look at. And um, Mr. Noonan said, and, um, Mr. Romero said a good thing was a survey, you know, um, calling the voters, you know, and seeing what their thoughts are on it. You know, um, I'll be one to say when they pass these past two measures for the school, I wasn't for it. I'm not afraid to say it. I wasn't supportive of it because they didn't change nothing on what they told us four years prior when we did the first two measures. And the people were told this all because we never done the school, you know, and it's something that we need to look into is, you know, getting the voters input on it for another bond to be added to the property tax for the next 30 years and all. That's my thing. What are you going to say something? Or? No. Okay. 
because this is a difficult decision just because we only have one year to make that raise two million dollars. Yes. Okay. I do. Okay. The new lady on the block. <laughs> <laughs> it's up to you. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Okay. Any thoughts? Um, I I have I actually I have, I have lots of thoughts. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, just listening to you all, I appreciate everybody's perspective. Um, I think that dependent on the final numbers of what homeowners will have to pay in taxes, you know, it can break down to ten or twenty dollars a month. Now that is not that is not a lot to some, but it is a lot to some people. Um, and I respect that and understand that. But if all if we all come together and we, you know, pay that, depending on how you look at it, we pay that amount, a small amount in the scheme of the Royal Theater project, we can get this thing going. So, you know, it's like the community coming together to to finish this project that we all want to see, you know. Finish. So that that is my thought, um, but I do believe that you know there are other valid ways to look at it as well. Mm -hmm. I think uh, this is one option we're looking at right now. But the other options, in terms of is there a donor out there that's going to kick in three million dollars? Uh, Kevin? Yes, Kevin. Kevin. Monster. <laughs> <laughs> that was cheesy. That was cheesy. Correct that. That was the, the, the assessed value. The assessed right? value. Yeah, that's yeah. not the market value. That's not the market value. That's the assessed value of what you purchased your home when you purchased it. That's correct. correct. That's correct. With slight increases, but not much. Well, yeah. we have a new development. We, we need to do that. But, uh, and and theoretically, I mean, if you're looking at people that are buying new homes in the upper amounts, they're really pay paying the lion's share. If you think about it, in terms of contributing to the idea of of something that I think, if you put the theater and get it running, it'll be a incremental. Put that there, then more economic activity will start. Then maybe commercial will develop in the 18 acres by Pasadena. The 80 million of Caltrans money tying in, undergrounding all that electric. And then by putting more commercial in between, before you know it, in 10 years, you're seeing these little pieces that will provide economic development for the community, which will help drive everybody's life. I mean, it would be a corner film for a city. Yeah, beautiful. And obviously, I'm biased. Um, I'm going to take this, but uh, an old Greek proverb the society grows great when people plant trees for shade, they will never sit on. Mm. Quite to get a good operator. What's the witch of the count? Um, yeah, Mr. Mayor, I wasn't planning on saying anything, but I, if I could just, I, I, I think that the council is looking, seems like they're looking too far down the road. There's a lot of steps along the way. This issue before you really comes down to whether you're willing to basically gamble $15,000 of the, the general fund money to hire a firm to start the process. Mm -hmm. That money will not come out of the general fund if the bond passes, but that will depend on whether you actually approve the contracts at the next meeting, because we're not hiring them tonight. Right. You're only authorizing the process to start. So you can still back out of it in two weeks if that's your wish. But if they get hired and they start doing their work, then we're on the hook for fifteen thousand dollars, not to exceed. I've read the contracts, mm -hmm. um, so that, that answers that question. That that won't be any more than that. Um, and then you still have the option, you know, based on if we, if maybe you want us to do a survey and you authorize us to look into that and and maybe spend a little bit more money, find out how the voters feel. So maybe by June or July we get the information and it looks good or it doesn't, and you can make a really informed decision at the time. So. Rather than my suggestion to you at that point is not to look at this like you're making the decision whether this goes on the ballot tonight, right, right. just right. whether we want to even consider it or it's already, we're not even interested in going down this road at all and learning more. What's the percentage? I'm not a mathematician. So you got 10,000, 
of 15,000 divided by 10 million. Yeah. How much money are we spending? Are you calculating that? Uh, yeah, how much, <laughs> what's the percentage of money that we lose okay, if on, we please. don't move forward with this? <laughs> And ultimately, it is, I mean, just to get to the ballot so you can have the okay. registered voters look at it and they decide themselves, you know. So oh, that's a point to think about. You know, and I, and I, and I appreciate Mr. Costa's, uh, you know, position on this because we people, uh, percentage wise, 80% voted for the school for both, both the, the measures, our tax measures. And uh, you know, in the school, um, the the theater, the show is in the middle of our, at the heart of the city. Uh, somebody mentioned, uh, I think, it surely mentioned that we we were actually asking the PCPA or the uh, Hancock College to be part of this whole process too. So there's where we the the group is re uh, reaching out to all avenues in terms of trying to get this thing moving forward. So. Um, I think it's. May I say something? I'm sorry. Well, no, you, you might. It's, oh. it's less than one point five percent. Yeah. What is it? Yeah. It's, it's yeah. Oh, zero, it's, zero, zero, yeah. It's like yeah, zero point one five five percent, correct? I think I did. Yeah, that. I, I I honestly I didn't oh. do the math, but yes, oh, now that I do it, yeah, you're right. Small amount. I just want to make that correction. And I and I like the three uh, the three concept. If we don't For do sure. it, uh, who's going to do it? Yeah. So it sounds like you want to make a motion on it. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're not obligated to the 160. I mean, I support, no, yeah. I support it to go to the voters. Sure, absolutely. Let the voters decide. I'd make a motion, but I don't know how. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> the new resolution. It's, not, it's in the staff report recommendation. Okay, well, you're right. I will. Okay. Is, is there a motion to approve resolution 2024? Uh, dash 26, the resolution of the city council and city of Guadalupe authorizing the hiring of Jones Hall, a professional law corporation, and and uh, w, I can't see that. Will Hanson. <laughs> okay. And Hanson and company to assist in the bond financing for the Guadalupe Royal Theater Renovation Project. That's your motion. I make a motion. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 Come on. Well, is there a second? I'll second that. Any discussion? Uh, roll call, please. Good night, Michael. Council member Costa Jr. No. Council member Robles? Yes. Council member Hernandez? Aye. Council Member Fernand? Aye. Mayor Julian? Aye. That's resolution then. Thank you all uh, for those who spoke. Uh, for and against it, it's, it's good to hear uh, comments in Phoenix. All right. Item uh, 14, renaming of Central Park. Anish, you're on. <laughs> Ms. Barajas. Barajas. Thank you. Um, since some of this happened before I was hired, I'm going to read the report uh, just because I want to be thorough. Um, and then we can go from there. Um, so there were discussions by the Recreation and Parks Commission regarding the renaming of Central Park, Central Park and it began, began last year. Around um, the time that the names of the streets and Pasadena community were going to be renamed after local Guadalupe veterans, the idea of renaming Central Park came up. Of course, um, over the course of multiple Recreation and Parks Commission meetings, the commission began to develop the idea of re recommending the renaming of Central Park to be named after something significant to Guadalupe. During the March meeting last year, Commissioner Emily Dryling uh, mentioned the March that March is Women's History Month and recommended to the commission that Central Park be renamed after a Guadalupe female of significance. Over the course of the next few meetings, the commission discussed rather than naming it after one single female to rename it Las Mujeres Park to recognize women as a whole. 
In order to still recognize an individual female, the commission recommended having a woman of the year nominated by the community to be recognized each year. Um, changing the name of Central Park to Las Mujeres Park would not only allow the new name uh, along with the renovation of the park itself, but also recognize the women of Guadalupe who have made a uh, positive impact on the community and its members. Um, the process uh, of selecting the recipient for the Mujeres Park Woman of the Year Award and inscribing her name on a professional memorial plaque at the park uh, would be reviewed and discussed in the future. Thank you. Any comments before we open up? The, and there's a civil way for uh, individuals who wish to comment on this. Um, we'll start with a, a written comment written correspondence from Shirley. Uh, I've got, I don't know where you were. I'll read it. I can see it. <clears throat> it's from Charlie Boydson. I uh, uh, received today via email. The renaming of the now Central Park needs much thought before a decision is made. Something significant as the agenda narrative said that would not be another person's name. We have O'Connell Park and Leeward Parks already. The new name should be something significant, yet generic and, and pertinent. Las Mujeres may be viewed as sexist, no male, or even racist in today's culture. Naming of an, an annual woman of importance is to be commended, but not in conjunction with a park. A park has been in that area since at least 1920, at least uh, a park has been in that area since 19. Uh, 26 when the little jail was built there and prior elevated tank was completed in 1928. It will be between 20, 2026 and 2028 when the park upgrades are completed. How about the name Centennial Park, which will note an era in the city's growth and uh, city's citizen involvement, Shirley Boyston. Uh, next uh, person, uh, Emily uh, Dreven. Uh, please come up. Thank you. All right, second time the charm, right? There you go. All right, well, thank you. Uh, so I know many of you already, my name is Emily Dryling, and I am one of the Parks and Recreation uh, Commissioners here, and I do have two of my other commissioners joining me uh, here today as well. Uh, while Blue Harris, as we were talking about it, one of the things that is very consistent across our community is that our community wants a sense of pride. We want the sense of belonging. We want the sense of being able to contribute and to be a part, and so, Thinking through how we came up with Las Mujeres was talking about in our entire city, we have one street named after a female. It's not even in existence yet, but it's going to be in Pasadena phase three. All of our parks are named after um, different men in our community as well. And if you zoom out of Guadalupe and look at the state of California, only two state parks are named after women and only one national park in California are named after women. And so we really thought this would be a great opportunity to Rename a park that can be more inclusive of our total population here in Guadalupe. I'm absolutely not saying that the men that the streets and the parks are named after us haven't done significant contributions, but this is an area that we are lacking in representation, and it would give us the opportunity to really be inclusive and not only name it after one person, but someone on a yearly basis, they have the opportunity to continue to evolve and continue to recognize those contributions over the course of the year. So as a Parks and Recreation Commission, we did want you to consider this recommendation as something that would really put Guadalupe on the map. Um, it is something that is forward thinking. It's something that we need to increase representation. And just thinking as March is Women's History Month, as we move into August, that's Women's Equality Day. Uh, this is an opportunity for us to help educate, especially the young girls in our community. Like, we have a park here in our community, and it's one of the very few that are actually represented in the state of California, and that it gives us the opportunity to be able to showcase really 50% of our population that's not yet been represented um, in our other street names and parks. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, Francis Romero. Well, good evening again. Um, as I mentioned, I was mayor once, and I have been the only one mayor ever elected in Guadalupe in its 78 years of being incorporated. I currently serve on a nationwide nonprofit board of advisors for a bipartisan women's group 
made up of former elected officials. There are about a dozen of them. I have the uh, honor to serve with a variety of former congresswomen, attorney generals, and we have someone from Guadalupe, which blows my mind all of the time when I meet with these women to fund uh, efforts to get more women in politics regardless of party. I have to say I'm a little torn on this one as a former park commissioner for both the county and the city because there is a lack of representation for women, but I don't know that I, I tend to agree with Shirley that having a gender specific name on a park, I'm not I'm not quite there, but I do think that a very nice improvement at Centennial Park, if it were to be renamed Centennial, as I clearly suggests, with a perpetual uh, monument and perhaps an improved area with a gazebo where uh, women, moms, and their children to go and uh, reflect would be a, a nice thing to do. And there's nothing that says that some streets can be renamed over time, uh, just <laughs> lack of inclusion. But on, on one hand, I do feel that a non-specific woman's name just kind of, it's not going to be just a woman's park. It's a park for everybody. And just some of how kids are, you know, the little boy's gonna go to the girl park. I mean, who knows? But anyway, um, I think that before you you jump and you make the name change, you should consider other options to recognize women who have significance in the community. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Nunes. That's a lot of the planning meetings for this um, reorganization of the park, redevelopment of the park. And I remember that one of the ideas that was espoused was to have a centralized gathering spot. I assume they took that notion from the name uh, Central Park, why it's called that, and what, why it's specifically um, named that. Leroy Park, of course, is named for the Leroy family who, who in the deed, to the city or to the emerging town, it's specified in perpetuity that the land would always be used for the um, for town activities and for town um, collegiate. I'm not. I find myself, uh, Mrs. Romero. We didn't. We didn't compare notes, but I'm also torn as a member of the historical society, and and I work with the cemetery board now. I am up to my eyeball in history and the beautiful, wonderful tapestry that Guadalupe is. And behind every great man, there is a great woman, Petro Concepcion. You know, she uh, she came here in the 1930s and was here her entire life from Mexico and was in intrinsic to the life at the church and the life in the senior center. In the 80s, she was going to the senior center to serve did lunch to other other. Uh, Seniors in her 80s. You know? Well, other women that I can think of, the women that I grew up with, the women's story that I told last February, there's such a beautiful, beautiful tapestry here. But to, to use the park to honor them, I think, I think we could do better. We could have an annual affair at the park. And we can honor a, a we can honor several women every year that are part of this community. Maybe they didn't build a, a building and maybe they weren't part of this. And maybe they didn't head this committee. Maybe they were just living their lives and raising their children and part of the community. And, and so I I would suggest or put forward that we call it the Guadalupe Park. It's supposed to be for everybody and for the whole community. And yet we can already hear some marketers going, well, there's problems with that. And people would say Guadalupe Park and then they would think we were part. Well, they'll get over it. Anyway, uh, those are my thoughts, and and I also did want to mention too. If you do change it and you name it for the individual, I assume that there's signage involved, and there's an effort to let the world know that you've done that, and, and what costs, how the, how would that cost be absorbed, and who would be paying for that, and who would be organizing that? And um, again, honoring Guadalupe, the women of Guadalupe, past, present, and the future is um, something that should be done. 
all the time. But anyway, thank you for your thank you. Anybody else out there? Speak? Emily, commissioners? Uh, Emily? I call it Oh. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I looked at the uh, opposition and particularly the uh, email that was written on this. And I took exception to two things. One, that this is somehow sexist, and the other is somehow racist. I mean, we're in a male dominated world. Let's face it. Anytime we get an opportunity to think out of the box and leave something up to a woman, and in this case, generally, women in general, I think it's a great opportunity. And I think in terms of the racist part, in that case, if we follow that logic, let's start changing the Lasani part. Let's change all these other parts that have you know, Latino or Hispanic names. It just doesn't uh, resonate with me. And I really uh, think you should consider naming the park less than this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. By the way, uh, that surely mentions in 1928. It was uh, it was a park. It, it was a a pond. I used to sh shoot the uh, frogs down there. <laughs> so uh, uh, I don't even know when we call it Central Park. I, mean, I was talking to Phil. Well, <laughs> yeah, but you can't shoot. I used to frog in Spanish. Rana. 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 Um, I'll let other folks chime in before I chime in. Um, as a woman of color and the uplift London, um, I grew up here in the city of Abu Dhabi, um, and my mother told me I couldn't speak Spanish if I wouldn't be excluded from certain things at school. Um, and I think it's really important that we empower girls to um, strengthen our economy, um, making sure that they are also other people. So the more that we can do for the women and boys. Good. I agree with her. <laughs> um, so when you look at the streets name, everybody thinks males. The streets are named after last name, not particular to any specific gender. You know, Tagazini, that's the Tagazini family. Capodonico, Capodonico family. Hernandez, you know, it's, it's a last name. It's not saying that it's that specific gender as a male that it's after. There's how many parks here? Probably big and middle, 12. Well, okay, well, without Pasadena. Without Okay. Well, so either, okay. Jack Park. I was the kid when they named that park. Leroy Park. That's been Leroy Park for years since I was a kid growing up. You know, my grand my grandfather lived on Tangazini. That park technically is not really named, but that's we call that Tangazini Park. You go to the park that's off the of Third and Lindy. That used to be Third Street Park to us until they named it after Papa Breda, who was one of uh who used to work here and died in a car accident years back, and he was he would open the gym for us for basketball. You know, so to look at it as difference, it's like there's a lot of women in our community who have done outstanding things, you know, um, maybe making something like, you know, who mentioned, you know, having an annual celebration, but leaving it still kind of, you know, Central Park or what would be Centennial Park would be more suffice as it's including everybody because it's more of a family thing. I know that's my take on it. Yeah. I, I have no problem with the most of part either. Um, I mean, we like we live in a society where it is male dominated. I mean, a lot of the names that are out there, I mean, um, just to, you know, to remember them. Yeah, I don't have any issues with that. And I, um, yeah. I, um, I think one of the things that has been said multiple times is that it's not inclusive to call it Las Mujeres, but at the same time, how is Leroy Park 
or Jack O'Connell Park or Paco Perea Park being inclusive of females or being inclusive of even kind of to what Shirley was saying, if you're thinking about race, like if we're really going to be that specific about it, there's a bunch of parks that are not inclusive. In San Maria, there's like Robin Ventura, there's all kinds of parks that are named after specific people. And I feel like the idea behind this was to be inclusive, to include females. So I, I don't really... And one of the things that we had talked about during the commission meeting was when we do each year during March, pick somebody and do a ceremony is to have like a women's day type of festival at that park. But I don't know, that's just my tip. There's, uh, thank you. Thank you, Hannah. There's one street named at the one. Yeah. Julia Drive. And I said, I'm going to put in on the end of it because that's what we do. <laughs> um, you look at uh, Dorothy Oliveira, Peter Mito, um, uh, what's your name? Betty Silva. Um, I, I see a picture of their softball team that we used to play, that they used to play, not me, we used to, they used to play. This is back in the 30s. Think of their own. They had, they would, there was a, they played against the wax in the, and Camp Cook and beat them softball. And um, um, I think that it's time uh, it's time for us to show the community that we and that we do respect women, and because we do. And uh, now we can make a motion. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a second? I second. I second it. Okay. Any discussion? Uh, roll call, please. Council Member Carlson Jr. Aye. Council Member Robles. Aye. Council Member Hernandez. Aye. Council Member Fernell. Aye. Mayor Julia. Thank you. All of any audience. But Hannah, that means you need to come back every year. I think the first one should be Amelia Viega. Did you hear that? She wants it in the minutes. She wants it in a minute. Just the um the next um what's on this slide presentation will be the approves resolution and necessity to issue bonds. Or wait, no, I'm sorry, that's not until June. Forget it. I jumped ahead. Nothing. Nothing. Um, oh. Item sixteen uh, announcements. Council activity reports and Gene. I got a couple of things. All right. What? Yeah. I don't know. Um, so I wanted to say is I did a tour of the Wake Water Track. Right. And I encourage my other fellow council members to talk with uh, Devin or Dave and go out there and kind of see the process that go through with it. You know, it's not as bad as you think, sir. You can go out there. <laughs> oh, I've been through many of them. Have you been to art? Yeah, but not, not, but I've been through other mechanical okay. systems as well. Uh, I, I, it was pretty interesting to see a lot of the stuff that we have there that can really help that needs some upgrading on uh, yeah. and things. And I told them I, I'd come back and let my fellow council members know that, you know, if you ever get a chance, take a tour to kind of see. The process and they showed me how the process goes. And I'll tell you, man, that last process when they pulled out a sample of the water that gets re Great put man. out for, you know, it's not potable water, so it goes out for the land and stuff. Great how man. clear it is, I was amazed that the stuff that they pulled from there to do was pretty cool. And then my second thing is, I know, um, they're talking about a fundraiser going on at the Red Barn this weekend, but there's also the, it's called Steam Club from Mackenzie, 
will also be having a fundraiser this weekend at the Topo Club from, I believe it's 12 to 5. And it would be, be nice to have some of our staff and um, community members go out. I went to the one they did a few months back. It wasn't very well advertised about, but it's something that's pretty cool because uh, the teacher that does it is uh, one of the teachers, the science teacher, uh, Adam Kennedy, and he uses this money to help take the kids down to LA for field trips, uh, to go to like um, art museums and stuff like that. So it was pretty interesting, pretty cool. So this, those are the two things. What STEAM uh, stand for? <laughs> yeah, I, I just know is that the A is for art, but it's like technology. <laughs> Um, math is one of them. Engineering, engineering, arts, and math. Yeah, yeah they, it used to be STEM, but they put they I made it STEAM. So now they oh, okay. The art is has a little more STEAM on it. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what. So it'd be pretty, you know, pretty nice. To, so that's well, going to find at social club. Well, five at social club. What are you gonna have? Uh, whatever the social club. Is. Okay. And so part of the proceeds wine? go. Yeah, wine. Uh, the kids. Is for no, the kids won't be there. <laughs> but it's uh one of the proceeds go to that to, the, okay, to that cool. program to help okay. fund for uh the trips they made. <laughs> the mobile market will be here March thirtieth, uh this weekend. I don't know the hour that we get oh. rain or shine. Okay. okay, around that time. Okay. Um, we'll post it on social media. Uh the Kiwana has also just started their fundraising, also to start the ball will be community. Excuse me, can you repeat the date for that? The mobile market? Yeah. The mobile market will be March 30th. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The mobile market will be March 30th from 1 to 3. Thank you. Yeah, um, Bobcat's um, wrestling program, our numbers have actually exceeded. Um, last it was our first year program, we we're at 25. Right now we're at 59. I've got tons of girls that are coming out for wrestling, and, yeah. and guess what? They're, they're getting it. Um, they're getting on it. We got some grit. Um, they're learning what hard work is and discipline. Um, they're sweating quite a bit. I got guys out there, boys, girls. Um, we're promoting uh, higher education. We're make, we're we're uh, making it mandatory. You know, with the school program, with the minimum two point no Fs. They can have uh, no use, unsatisfactory behavior. So we do have a first tournament on the thirteenth at Mesa Middle School. And it will be all girls and some of our novice boys who've never stepped on a mat. And I think that alone is still about close to 40. So it's exciting. Uh, it's going to be a quick month and a half. And, and we have uh, three duels here at City Hall. So I want you guys to come out and check them out. And uh, got to coordinate with uh, Chief if we can get a standby out there. Those dates uh, should be exciting. That's it. Okay. Um, briefly, um, this past last Thursday, Santa Barbara County Association of Government, STCAG, and they're approaching a control district met uh, at the government center. Um, a lot of money going into the roads, so, and a good portion of it's coming here to North County. But then uh, some of you may have been there at the Rancho Wild Bed Preserve uh, ribbon cutting this past. Uh, Friday, I went there. I, was, I, I went there Sunday. Uh, Saturday, I was talking to the ranger Tina, and at seven thirty in the morning, the parking was full. So the lot was full already. Mm -hmm. I went there yesterday at uh, Sunday at ten. The parking was full, and all you see is fishermen. And the reason they're there is fishing is good. Good. Buyer right like oh, you know, good right now. A lot of perch. Yeah. Of perch. Go further down, you get several clams. So. All the way to this one. That's all I had. Just I don't Filipino. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, is there during, during the, the closed session? Is most of you adjourned the closed session? Some of you adjourned the closed session. Is there a second? Second. 
Falou, Pedro. Marcos, você é? Vai. Vai.